Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Central Wisconsin Book Festival and this event featuring Central Wisconsin's own Cornerstone Press. My name is Eddie, and I'm one of the organizers for the festival. Uh, before we begin this event, we want to recognize our sponsors and supporters. Before we begin, we would like to thank those organizations and businesses that helped make this year's festival possible. Our presenting sponsors and benefactors this year are the Community Arts Grant Program and Community Foundation of North Central Wisconsin. The funds provided by the Wisconsin Arts Board. The Community Foundation. The BA and Esther Raynett Foundation. American County Public Library Foundation. Ruderware. And the CoVantage Harris Foundation. Our 2021 sustainers are Wisconsin Humanities with funds from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Portage County Public Library Foundation. Other supporters include the Marathon County Public Library, the Portage County Public Library, McMillan Memorial Library, the Friends of the Marathon County Public Library, the Marathon County Historical Society, Whitewater Music Hall, Wisconsin Public Radio, and Yankee Bookstore. Thank you so much to all of our sponsors and supporters. And thanks to you. Thanks to you. And thanks to you. And thank you to you. Thanks to you, all of our authors, all of our readers. And thanks to you for being part of the Central Wisconsin Book Festival. Thank you. Let me just. Okay. So, um, we have four authors here from um, who have all published through our local Cornerstone Press. That's our university press at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. And um, so each one of them will get a, a segment uh, to share something about their book and their writing. And um, then we'll have a little bit of time for, for questions for each. Uh, so first of all, it is my pleasure to introduce Patricia Ann McNair. Um, she has managed a gas station served as a medical volunteer in Honduras, sold pots and pans door to door, tended bar and breaded mushrooms, working on the trading floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and now teaches in the English and Creative Writing Department of Columbia College, Chicago. Um, her book, The Temple of Air, received Southern Illinois University's Devil's Kitchen Readers Award and the Chicago Writers Association Book of the Year Award. And These Are the Good Times was a Montaigne Medal finalist. And my intro says she lives in Chicago, but I believe she said she just moved to Arizona. <laughs> so um, Patricia, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eddie. And it was great to see that video and to see all the support behind this. Uh, festivals, book festivals are amazing things. And I'm really pleased to be part of this one. I'm also honored um, to be part of the public, the Portage Public County Library, I think Portage County Public Library, sorry, um, to be part of their programming. And I'm really happy to be here with my Cornerstone author family, Robert and Margaret and Jamie Lynn. So this is great that this is part of something that a library will do. It reminds me of the time when I was at a library reading of Dorothy Allison. Perhaps some of you know Dorothy Allison's work. Her big book was Bastard Out of Carolina. Um, I was an emerging writer then, a student of writing, and she read from Cave Dweller, I believe was the book that she, she was reading from then. And at the end, in a Q&A, in that way that often happens for fiction writers, uh, somebody asked, so how much of that was true? And Dorothy Allison, in her way, her wonderful, charming Dorothy Allison way, puts a hand on her hip and says, oh, honey, it's all true. And then she says, how much of it is autobiographical? Autobiographical, though, is a different story. And you'd have to stick around if you wanted me to tell you all of that. And so I, I've often thought about that, what Dorothy Allison said about that idea of a story being true, not necessarily autobiographical, but the way to make fiction true. How do we do that? I've thought about it when I read, and I've certainly thought about it when I write, I ask myself, what is true in this story? And over the years, I've come to believe that 
The way I make a story true, a fictional story true, is by tapping into my own observations, my own memories, and then combining that with my imagination in order to find the deeper truth in the fiction. So even when a story or a situation is wholly made up, which fiction is supposed to be by definition, even when it's made up, I find that it's truth somehow lies in those, those things that, that I imagined, yes, but also in those things that I remember and those things that I've observed and those, those things that I put together with that, that recipe of imagination, observation and, uh, and memory. And that's the way that I find the truth of the, the story. And perhaps the best way for me to, to show you what I mean by that is to read. Um, I'll read one of my stories from Responsible Adults, the Cornerstone publication. This one's called Salvage, and it's a story told from a narrator who is a young man remembering things. Daddy shopped salvage. Tins, those were his favorite. Unmarked cans, their labels stripped from their curved bodies dented some of them. Those were the ones mother feared most. Never ever eat from a dented tin, she warned us. You boys hear me? Saturday mornings, daddy would pack me and my brother in the station wagon and drive to New Hope, two towns over. Railroad salvage was the sign above the shop's door, a white plank with painted black words, a thing that looked like the stuff inside, battered, and worn, the letters big and small, no pattern, no discernible sense of order. Mother preferred order. Daddy was a fan of mess and the surprises found in it. Why railroad, I wondered, walking the narrow winding paths through plastic sleeves of tube socks, snow shovels with broken handles, lampshades torn and yellowed, three-legged chairs, labelless tins. I imagined hobos, like those in the stories daddy read to us over and over in his voice that sounded like music, mellow, deep, like a bass guitar. Me and little Jakey under the blankets in our skinny bed, listening, listening. Hobos I imagined with packs from bandanas and sticks slung over their shoulders, tossing cans off a moving caboose, hurling chairs and lampshades socks to their buddies, the salvage store proprietors in the weeds along the tracks. Like daddy, I love the cans most of all. Dinner time when mother was working because as she said, somebody had to. Daddy would strew a bunch over the counter, tall and squat, shiny and dull, dented and not. He'd sing them that Danny, by, Danny boy song, only Donnie, he'd say, me my name. And one after another, we would open things, canned meat, gray and smelling of pepper, olives, their red stuffing vibrant, soaking in murky oil. Something like marshmallow fluff, only not, like frosting, but no. We'd pass the cans between us, daddy, little Jakey, me, pushing our forks into them, chewing with our mouths open, smiling. Once there were worms inside, wiggling around finger-sized ears of corn, we threw that can away. Once it was snakes, the springy kind made of cloth and coil shooting up past my nose when I pried the can open. Little Jakey atop a phone book on a chair at the kitchen table laughed and laughed. I did too, once the fright slowed in my chest. Daddy didn't notice his face toward the window, over the sink, out, looking out. Rubber balls, plastic fangs, miniature tubas, glass eyes, more and more stuff, less and less often food. It was fun at first, this daily dinnertime treasure hunt, until we got hungry. Mother worked until midnight. We could hear her, little Jakey and me, walk up the gravel drive, hear her come into the kitchen and gather the cans to throw in the trash. We could hear her put away the bread and cheese she brought home from the all night shop where she worked. 
in town and we could hear our stomachs rumbling, our father snoring. Once after the salvage was ropes of plastic beads and cotton balls and condensed milk, I heard mother in the kitchen, the familiar chuck and hiss of the can opener. I climbed over little Jakey and crept out of bed, my stomach rolling with nothing but the sweet thick of condensed milk. There she was, mother at the table, a hand under her chin. She turned the can upside down and I waited for the spill, boiled peanuts or brass rings or how I would dream this moment later. And always teeny tiny men who looked like fathers or hobos landing on their feet and scampering away like insects in a sudden light. The can was empty, daddy was gone. 20 years later, as I make chain store-bought beans and franks for my own boy, Jake, my wife at the breakfast bar laughs when I hold the can up to my ear before I open it. I shake it a little and listen some more. Donnie, she says, shh, I say to her, and she covers her mouth with her hand, but her shoulders shake and her eyes glimmer, and I love her so much it makes my toes tingle. Shh. I say to my little Jakey in his high chair and giggling and banging a spoon on his tray. I listen harder, the cool of the can against my cheek, and there it is, quiet, in the tinny slosh and tumble of whatever is inside, the low and lonely whistle of a train passing in the night, deep notes from a bass guitar, my father's voice. So that's the story. And what I, I, I imagine you're thinking, what in this story is autobiographical? So things drawn from my own life. Obviously, I think I'm not a man. I'm also not a parent. Um, I've never been a parent. Uh, but my father did love to buy label-less tins. He did love to shop in railroad salvage stores. And in fact, that was a Saturday thing that we would do. We would go to the railroad salvage down at Maxwell Street. Uh, if you know Chicago, you know Maxwell Street. Um, he especially loved the ones without labels because he loved the surprise of that. He discovered a fish soup powder in a big bucket that didn't have a label. And he searched for that every time we went and he would buy something that looked like it, but it was never quite it again, but he really loved that search. So that's part of the, the truth as well. There's also um, a family story that before he settled down into our suburban life, he did ride the rails. He did jump trains. He did travel around um, the, the country that way. So all of that part is true. Some from things I've been told, things I imagine, memories so on. Um, I also lost my father when I was 15 years old. He died unexpectedly and uh, suddenly of a heart attack on his way home from work. So even though he didn't officially abandon us like the father in this story did, I still carried that sense of abandon with, abandonment with me and I still carry that sense of abandonment with me. Um, that missing him that longing for him, that never ending search for, a, for an absent father as part of this story actually comes from my own story as well. I think it's probably the ghost of him that I conjured up by giving these details, these memories to the story. It helps me to make my own story feel real to me and I hope to you. So how much of this story is autobiographical? Um, while it isn't a story precisely from my own life, it certainly has its autobiographical bits. And I think probably more importantly, the question is, how much of this story is true? Uh, honey, it's all true. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Um, that was <laughs> that was a really cool story. Um, yeah, really got drawn into that. Um, we're just about, okay, we're just about a, a quarter after, so I'm going to go ahead and <laughs> moving along. Oh, okay, it looks like maybe one question. Uh, oh, <laughs> from Danielle, I wondered if opening the can of worms is metaphorical, or if that's just like the reality. I mean, 
I think Margaret was saying that kind of rang true, like something that could actually happen. So I don't know where that, where around the spectrum that fell for you. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's both, you know, yeah. <laughs> what are the worms of the story? Um, but yeah, I also, you know, back in the day before uh, they sterilized everything so much, it wasn't unusual to open a can of something and find find worms in there as well. But it certainly is that idea, you know, there, there are worms in what seems uh, seems nutritional sometimes. Mm. So that metaphor was certainly there as well. I think I discovered it as opposed to Im imposed it though. Sure, yeah, for sure. All right, thank you. Um, we'll have some more. Oh, and Dorothy Allison is one of, is one of my heroes. Thank you for mentioning her work. Cool, <laughs> all right. Um, so we'll we'll have some time for questions for everybody at the end, but I want to make sure we get time for everyone too. So I'm going to go ahead. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Robert Miltner. Uh, Robert is the author of a collection of Flash Creative Nonfiction, Ohio Apertures. Uh, he's the recipient of an Ohio Arts Council Individual Excellence Award for Poetry, an Ohio Arts Council Fellowship at Vermont Studio Center, and a writer a writing residency. And I'm going to say this wrong: Wasayak Project. So Robert can tell us more about that. Um, he's a professor emeritus, a professor emeritus of English at Kent State um, and uh, was the poet in residence at the Chautauqua Institution in 20, uh, the summer in uh, 2021 and edits the Raymond Carver Review. So uh, please join me in welcoming Robert. Robert, you're muted. Mute. There we go. There we go. He speaks. Okay. Thanks for having me here, Eddie. This is great. Um, being connect. I I I I was a library kid growing up, and so it's always great to find ways to come back and reconnect with what libraries do and the importance of them. And it's great to be with these cornerstoners. I'm not sure that's quite the term we all want, but. Um, I've had a wonderful experience working with, uh, with Cornerstone Press. Uh, my book is Ohio Apertures. It's a gorgeous cover by Morgan Dyer. I came kind of late to uh, nonfiction. Uh, primarily my work is as a poet and a prose poet. Uh, I've published a book of short stories, but I became intrigued with uh, creative nonfiction. And so as I've always done, I just started writing them and trying to do different things. Oddly, I never set it really to write a book as much as I just wanted to learn the craft. So when I put the book together, it almost reads like a, an anthology of different types of flash prose. There's, there's, there's narrative nonfiction, there's uh, lyric essays, there's braided essays, there's travelogue pieces, there's hybrids between uh, prose poetry and creative nonfiction. It's almost like a small carnival between covers in a way. Um, and um, the piece I'm going to read is entitled Cartographer's Tale. And it's one of the few pieces I, I've ever written where I actually like, I'm going to write this piece and enter that contest, you know. So I wrote this for Writers, um, Writers Magazine, and, uh, uh, and uh, I didn't win, but that didn't matter. I, I, got a, I got a piece out of it that I really liked. So um, I guess I'll just jump in and let the story tell itself. But I do want to uh, touch on one thing before I do, and it has to do with the idea of truth, which we were, that was being mentioned a moment ago. And one of the epigrams for one of the sections is this one. This is from uh, W.G. Sebald, who's a, a, a writer I, I admire so much. You adulterate the truth as you write. There isn't any pretense that you try to arrive at the literal truth. And the only consolation when you confess to this flaw is that you're seeking to arrive at a poetic truth. So, a cartographer's tale. The epigram is from Mary Oliver. You never know where a sentence will take you. The older I became as a child, the quicker I learned how to disappear down the street. And why not? I was a curious boy. I tended to wander off or uh, wander off after any cat or bird. If I was allowed to leave the yard, my parents insisted I stay on the sidewalk. 
When I was still too young to go to school, they told me to stay close to our house on 191st, just off Curtis Drive in Cleveland. So there I would be safe while riding my small bike, bored with the same five houses in one direction, six houses to the corner and the other, a limited back and forth route on my block, which from my mother's perspective, I was watchable. But the, the minute my mother turned her back, giving attention to one of my brothers, changing a load of laundry or talking on the phone, the world beyond my own recalled to me. So I would go farther than the two houses down to my Aunt Fran's, down to the end of the street where there was a vacant lot that had large maple trees and lots of shrubs and bushes, places to look for blue jay feathers and robin's nests or wildflowers such as spring violets or the tiger lilies of summer. And if I got as far as the end of the street, I'd come to the valley, as we called it, the Cleveland Metro Parks. The passable gap between two shrubs was a leafed turnstile. The beginning of a path where the older kids would go. It was like a doorway away from my known neighborhood into a wild and exotic landscape. I couldn't resist it. I loved the twists and turns the paths took down into the valley, across the river from the little metropolitan golf course where the bridle path follows the valley to the horse stables. Brown rabbits abounded, robins, cardinals, woodpeckers, sparrows, finches were abundant, and turtles, frogs, and toads were common. Minnows and gar swam the shallows. Just about any third rock from the riverbank turned over in the shallows exposed salamanders and newts. The valley was my kindergarten, a living guide, lost my place, a living guide I experienced before I went to school. After moving though from the city out to Avon Lake in Lorraine County, I lived on a street that began near Lake Erie and ended in a forest of pin oak, silver maple, American elm, sassafras, dogwood, and sumac. I spent whole days letting paths take me to where they led. Once, I spent a morning following a garter. I roamed open fields and woods grown lush from the lake effect ecology, exploring the abandoned orchards of pear and apple, of grapevines and wild blackberry thickets. Before long, I discovered how pin oak branches grew in such a way that they were like a spiral staircase I could not just climb, but walk up to the highest branches. Sitting up there, Looking down at birds was the closest I've ever come to flying. Once, I discovered an old, some old buckled sidewalks poured by the WDP, WPA during the Depression in anticipation of the eventual suburban sprawl. For a child, it was like finding monoliths or standing stones in Ireland or Scotland. The numerous ponds to sum off some of the paths were miraculous teeming with tadpoles, which metamorphosized into frogs, stone-like shells of secret turtles, and always the dodge and weave of dragonflies and damselflies. These wanderings and experiences from my childhood have become somehow a template for how I write. Helpful prepositions show me location, relationship, and connections. At, by, with, near over, under, around, across, so that neither writer nor reader gets lost, while trees and bushes and flowers along the way are adjectives defining depth, shadow, subtlety, hue. Simple sentences. Simple sentences are sidewalks leading straight to surprising places. Expressed in the American vernacular, they sound crisp, clean, confident, as if spoken by Harry Truman, or like clipped lines lifted from a William Carlos Williams poem. Such literary structures move me word by word from where I first begin a piece of writing to an ending that eventually closes. The compound complex and compound complex sentences are like roaming down a path in the woods. Once I start into such a complicated structure, there's often no telling where it will lead what discoveries await. Each turn on the path or phrase leads to a new dimension. Another clearing or clause along the trail reveals another idea, 
some condition or tangent which invites the explorer in me to follow. And those sentence fragments, their stops and starts, the halting along the way to view something unexpected, a bird's egg fallen from a nest, a strange fungus named dead man's fingers, or a skull of a skunk. The clean lines of independent clauses feel like deer trails crossing the path, offering alternatives I would not have imagined. Hard workers that I can depend upon without worry. They're as reliable as friends once, what friends one once had in grade school. And just as paths lead to places, to cities, to countries in the world, so too do sentences lead to paragraphs, pages, and ultimately to books. Henry David Thoreau trod paths of wonder at Walden. Charles Dickens wandered familiar labyrinths in London's back streets. And wandering writer W.G. Sebald nightly walked the urban streets, the country lanes, as well as emotional fan fantasies and memories. From roadways he'd walked in Dublin, Trieste, and Paris, James Joyce wove his textured tales. And Virginia Woolf knew from her microcosmic Bloomsbury blocks all the doorways leading in and out of the varied lives there. William Faulkner laid infinite time upon infinite time as his Mississippi country roads yielded the complexity of human relationships. Emily Dickinson walked her small garden of a yard as if it was the world for her world itself as for her it was. Walt Whitman bodied forth from Long Island at 14, never stopping as he reached out with wide arms to bring all of North America into his poems. And Raymond Carver in his late sober years walked train tracks or the summer fields of the state of Washington, narrating the lyric moments of the wonder of his still being alive. Writing takes me simultaneously on two profound paths, both into myself and out into the world. I become travel wise and enriched in the same way that straying from the yard off the sidewalk used to give me the gift of adventure, exploration, and the ability to remain astonished. Because any pencil can be transformed into a walking stick. The act of writing is a journey, a process of discovery that evolves into the product or trace of the experience, or as a kind of map to show me both the places I've been, as well as the places I have yet to go. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Looks like we have uh, <laughs> a couple minutes if anyone wants to put some things, uh, some questions in the chat. And Robert, I know there were a couple of comments along the way if you want to look uh, in the chat there. Um, yeah, that was <laughs> that was cool. Just pick um, one. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Grammar nerd. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's me too. <laughs> Thank you, Ursula and sisters, for all those diagrams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was the. Let's go to the other readings. We save. So I don't want to cut into anybody's time. We'll save questions sure. for later. Okay. Great. Yeah, that's just fine. All right. So. Um, all right, moving right along. Um, so uh, third, it's my honor to introduce Margaret Rosga um, as the 2019 through 2020 Wisconsin Port Laureate. Uh, she co-edited the anthology Through This Door, Wisconsin in Poems and the chapbook anthology On the Front Lines slash Behind the Lines. Um, her fifth book of poems is Holding Myself Together, New and Selected Poems. Uh, so that's the cornerstone one. Uh, Rosga's poems draw, draw on her experiences and interests as an educator, avid reader and researcher, parent, and advocate for social and racial justice. Um, she serves as the first artist scholar at the UWM Waukesha Field Station. So welcome, Margaret. Thank you, Eddie, and thank you all for being here. It's a delight to participate in the Central Wisconsin Book Festival and to at last see 
my fellow Cornerstone Press authors. This is a first for us, and it's it's quite a thrill, actually. Um, the story of my book coming into being, uh, there were not so many selves to hold together uh, in the beginning. Actually, I met um, Ross Tangadal, the director of the press at a, a Wisconsin Writers Association conference. Well, I knew him before, but I saw him again at this conference at the point at which the, the Alice in Wonderland themed poems that are at the beginning of the book um, were the book. Uh, and so I began to talk about the possibility of publishing with Cornerstone and the book grew. Um, I was at the same time writing or trying to write a memoir um, that wasn't going as well as the Alice poems were. Uh, so what I ended up deciding was that holding myself together is the memoir that I couldn't write in the first person the way memoir is usually done. I see Alice in Wonderland as, an, as a coming of age story and I identified with, with Alice. So let me begin by acknowledging Alice. I say, here is my girlhood story. She says nothing. He says, I'm sorry if you were upset. I say nothing, a song beneath the surface, music before words. I've been running away from myself for a long time. Every time I stop for a breath, I catch up. She catches up. Here I am, she says, refusing to be a victim. Can we collaborate? Definitely, I say. The music behind my words says no before saying yes, though not a nanosecond of pause. He says, what are you doing here? He says, what are you doing here? He needs, he says, he sends her to fetch gloves. He closes the sky. She says, I fancied that kind of thing never happened. He says he's late, has to hurry. He says friends, but first he sounds a pitch pipe, an internal pitch pipe. It sounds like clearing his throat. He throws her another question and another. She juggles them without dropping any. So I, I would imagine that a lot of you have memories of reading Alice or seeing the Disney movie. Uh, and there are some parts of it that I particularly like. And, and the book actually has poems that deal with some of the most memorable, um, but there were a few less obvious details like the fact that Alice meets the rabbit at one point and he misidentifies her. He thinks she's his servant and sends her to get his um, fan and, and some gloves. So Alice is running a lot. And I picked up that detail. Unlike Lewis Carroll, I take Alice into her adult years, uh, into her grown up years, and she becomes a marathoner, um, building on her experience of running through Wonderland. So Alice runs. She and her sister row up river without a care, picnic on the green along the riverbank. Her sister brings bound up words, unbinds them, reads. Alice tucks scarcely realized words into her pocket, runs, trips, falls. At bottom of her discomforting imagination, she encounters challenge after challenge. Excuse me, gets clobbered by off with her head. I begin to write, pause. No, that, that's not the way to start. Pause, think again. Better this start than none. It will come to me later. Cross out, delete, get up, walk away. Down at the river, full array of sun splay and flora. Ah, yes, and no, 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 too much. Keep running, yes, think, marathon. 
runners may read my words, every hesitant one of them. So Alice does have all these challenges, um, but she reaches a point where she takes control. Alice in control. Even when answered curtly, even when her questions beget questions, even when talk loops in caterpillar circles, who are you? Explain yourself. I don't see, not a bit. Even when it arcs around again to who are you? Even when she feels she is not herself, even when she feels she is losing her temper, Alice minds her manners, checks her voice. Well, I should be like to be a little larger, sir, if you wouldn't mind. Finally, the answer is right in front of her. In the mushroom, the caterpillar vacates. One side will make you grow taller, the other side will make you grow shorter. Alice thinks she may as well give it a try. She extends her reach, her arms half circle the mushroom. She breaks off a piece in each hand. This is where she wakes up to how she can take control. And then um, I referred to some of the questions that are tossed her way and gave some of those questions. And here are some more timely questions. One, the rabbit focused on his pocket watch. Did he have a pocket? Two, was he a quarter past his appointment time? Three, was he a quarter past reasonable? Alice's sister said she loved to row upstream to picnic, time unquartered. The rabbit said, oh, my ears and whiskers, how it's getting late. When the rabbit saw Alice, he didn't see her. He said, why, Mary Ann, what are you doing out here? Run home this moment and fetch me a pair of gloves and a fan. Her sister read Keats, all the while Alice was in Wonderland, sat quietly, read for an hour and three quarters. Four, who went deeper? Five, who is behind for the times? Six, who is ahead of the times? When Alice went to run the rabbit's errands, is that when she lost the best part of her young self? becoming then a quarter Marianne? If Alice had stopped on the way down to take a book from the shelf, would it have stopped her fall? Seriously, would that have been a better way to grow up? So a couple of... Um, poems from the other sections of the book. Um, Eddie said that part of my experience is working in civil rights activity. Uh, and this particular poem was originally written for the 50th anniversary of the open housing marches in Milwaukee. We put together a chapbook of poems called um, Where I Want to Live, Poems for Fair and Affordable Housing. And as long as I was thinking fair and affordable housing, I couldn't write a poem. But when I started to think about where do I want to live, this came. Cake and lemonade for neighbors. Where I want to live, neighbors gather on front porches, watch their children play across multiple front yards, laugh in Spanish, Arabic, Burmese, English, talk about back in the day, Share sweet and savory snacks, lend each other a cup of sugar or flour, borrow hedge trimmers, a shovel or rake, 
help with chores when need be, apologize when need be, offer a word of advice, not more, drum, strum guitars and pluck banjos, make a little noise sometimes, sometimes bring out a kitchen chair so everyone finds a comfortable place to sit on the unscreened wide or narrow porch or on the stoop. Sometimes just enjoy all black, brown, white, golden quiet together. I write a lot of poems that have multiple voices in them. Some of the Alice poems are that way. Uh, and sometimes I can read the poem by myself. Um, but sometimes I really need another reader. And so I want to thank Eddie, who volunteered to read this poem with me, um, this last poem. It's called Amplifying Hope. And you can see that in order to get the amplification, I need someone else. And Eddie will be that person. Amplifying hope. I hope no one gets hurt. I hope the earth survives. I hope we all survive. I hope there's space for Izzy to become an artist. For Leah to make music on her small violin. I hope. I hope. To open my refrigerator to yellow, orange, and green peppers, to kale, beets, carrots, turnips, tortillas, eggs, and butter. Even meat. I hope words don't fail me. I hope I don't fail words. Don't forget what goals I set. Don't forget to set grand goals. And don't forget the little ones. The fun of playing in snow despite the cold. Of cold water from a summer's sprinkler. Of listening to the grown-ups when they think they're unheard or the message missed. Don't forget to tell the little ones what our little hopes were, how we healed. It sound. How odd we were at autumn's ginger moon low on the horizon. How we learned the earth turns, how in all the gnarled world, people already hurt. Already hungry, already rendered speechless. Scant hope this world, may that scant hope not be dismantled. May the dismantlers not make things worse. What if we are our hope? We hold our hope in our clasped hands, in our broken, open hearts. I hope. I hope. We hope. We hope the, the earth, earth survives. survives. Thank you, Eddie. You were wonderful. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right, thank you, Margaret. <laughs> thank you for sharing. All right. Um, any quick questions for just Margaret? All right, let's go ahead and move forward and then we'll have time for some from questions or discussion at the end. All right, um, so finally, I'm happy to introduce Jamie Lynn Smith, a writer, editor, and teacher. Um, she earned her BA in English and Theater from Kenyon College, her Master's in Education from Fordham University, and her MFA in Creative Writing from Ohio State. Jamie Lynn is the fiction editor at Break Bread Magazine and a consulting editor for the Kenyon Review. Um, her work has appeared in many magazines. Um, she is currently working on Hometown, a novel about millennial crises and the rise of white nationalism in the rural Midwest. Um, for which she received a 2020 Ohio Arts Council Individual Excellence Award. And her short story collection, Township, is forthcoming from Cornerstone Press in December 2021. Thank you so much, Eddie. I really appreciate it. Um, and you just gave me a great idea for cutting down my bio. <laughs> 
nothing like summary, you know, not everything has to be done in scene is what I always tell my fiction students. So I need to, you know, take a page from my own book, so to speak. Um, but thank you so much for having me here today. And I also want to thank Ross, Dr. T. Tangadal for picking the book up and agreeing to publish Township. Um, one thing that has happened, we've decided to postpone the pub date until the end of January. So we'll have to wait just a little bit longer, but it's for a really, really good reason. Um, I really want to thank Robert and Patty and Margaret because it's just been so inspiring to, you know, be here today in this virtual space, kind of like in the company of such other great writers and um, all of whom are using place in such interesting ways in in, in, as a mode of storytelling. And that's that's kind of my jam. So it's wonderful to discover on our first meeting that there are so many things that um, that we that we share, you know, aesthetically and with the concerns in our writing. Um, I also want to thank the Wisconsin Book Festival. And um, I'm not going to say a whole lot before I launch into reading the first short story in my collection. Um, other than I will talk a little bit about place, which almost entirely informs um, most of what I'm writing right now. Um, I grew up in Knox County, Ohio, which is about 35, 40 miles northeast of Columbus. Um, most of my family is from Southwestern Virginia and from like uh, Texas, Kansas, Oklahoma area. So um, a lot of like, um, sort of Southern stuff and very heavily influenced by Appalachian culture. You know, we always kind of, in this place um, is populated by people who often have similar backgrounds. Um, it's sort of like Kentucky North, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, we have a lot of, um, it's also an interesting place landscape wise because there are mountains to the East and plains in the Western half. We've got swamps. Um, and wetlands that are just lush and beautiful. And, you know, in being in the Appalachian foothills, we're like in one of the most diverse ecosystems in the world. So it it is diverse um, in a lot of different ways. And I love uh, I love writing about it um, because it gives me a chance um, having moved away and lived elsewhere. Um, I spent most of my career in New York and in Los Angeles and then moved back to Ohio um, when I was in my late 30s. So writing about it, I have like an outsider and insider thing. And when I first moved back to the township where I grew up, um, there was, you know, we got neighbors and uh, the little girls next door across the street had this deer and they'd put a collar on it. And I was like, what, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> you know, you're not allowed to do that. Um, but it had been, it had been orphan and they, its name was Buck. His name was Buck. And um, they took care of it for quite a while. And the deer actually used to go jogging with me and my boxer. So, you know, the whole neighborhood kind of like got to know Buck and fed him and took care of him. And, um, that was really just the, the launch point, you know, that was all I needed um, for exploring some of the other tensions that are in a county that's rapidly, for lack of a better word, sort of like, you know, going through a rural kind of gentrification as it switches from becoming primarily agricultural and industrial to being um, a, sub a suburban bedroom community for, for Columbus. So um, lots of, uh, Things that happen in the story are loosely based in truth, but I, unlike Patty, most of this is a lie and I, <laughs> I make it up. So um, with no further ado, I will, um, I, I'm seeking truth in the telling of lies, I guess would be the aesthetic that I'm pursuing here today. Um, so I, uh, this is Nature Preserve. There were three spots on the Parks Commission in the South County Township election, and nobody ran for the third, so Ross joked that he and Cecil both won by a landslide. The job was just a trusteeship overseeing the nature sanctuary, a hundred-acre forested wetland that an elderly recluse deeded the county in her will. Cecil had just retired from the Department of Natural Resources when he first ran for the office, and now, after a decade toiling at trail maintenance and policing the deer dump, along came Ross Berger. As far as Cecil knew, Ross was still the same sanctimonious punk he had been in high school. Now here they stood, 40 years later, toe to toe in the township hall. Colleagues. 
Ross's 40-something girlfriend lurked nearby wearing a long fuzzy sweater that appeared to be held together out of fitful chunks of gray wool. In a heathered voice, she introduced herself as Skye with an E and frowned when Cecil asked if that was her given name or an assumed one. When the trustees convened, Cecil noted that Ross's jaw slacked while oathing, so help me God, and that his hand floated somewhat north of the Bible during the swearing in. Ross was a notorious local eccentric, semi-retired environmental attorney, activist, and rabble rouser, or so read his business card. It was printed on thick handmade paper flecked with leaves and what looked like lumpy varicose veins of fiber. Sky makes these if you ever want some done up, Ross said. Cecil glanced at Ross's calf high moccasins and wanted to ask if she also chewed the leather for those. Instead, he smiled politely and tucked the card into his billfold. Ross jawed on and on about collaborating as friends as well as colleagues and burying the hatchet. After all them years lawyering, Cecil said, you wouldn't know a hatchet if it slit you sideways across the hind end. I guess I'll just have to learn what I don't know by watching you, Ross replied, especially when it comes to public relations. Cecil's teeth locked. Ross had been breakfasting at Amvet's a couple of weeks back when Cecil strode in all knuckles and peak. Cecil dropped a plastic grocery sack on Sheriff Hallinan's table, scolding him that he had some nerve littering when he was a sworn lawman. TC sifted through the contents, food cartons, mail, cigarette butts, with the end of his fork, then stood. The bassoon growl of his chair scraping against the linoleum broke the quiet. I appreciate your enthusiastic approach to law enforcement, TC said, but I'm afraid you collared the wrong perk. My mail was stole this week. Ross saw Cecil's face redden when TC pressed the bag into Cecil's hands. Now take this rubbish on out of here and mind your manners with a sworn lawman. Cecil stammered an apology over the hum of onlookers' suppressed laughter, then slunk out shamed as a kick dog. Ross hadn't seen him at Amvet since. So Ross said, let's meet down there tomorrow and come up with a plan. All right, Cecil replied, I'll buy. Skye sidled up next to Ross and he put his arm around her small waist, looping one thumb through the belt tab of that wretched sweater. She leaned, she leaned in conspiratorially towards Cecil and said, Ross is so excited about this. Really looking forward to sharing all his experiences in activism and community organizing. The campaign is over, ma'am, Cecil replied. Skye's smile tightened. That must be a relief to you. She whispered to Ross that Cecil was an asshole, just like he said. Cecil almost liked her then. They took leave of each other in the parking lot, Cecil making sure to squeeze Skye's hand farewell, then give her a wink when Ross closed the passenger door and made his way around to the driver's side of their car. Ross adjusted his mirror several times on the drive home. That had to be Cecil, beh Cecil behind him, tailgating as usual. The men lived on opposite ends of Church Road, a two mile long stretch of gravel that ran from their respective properties and bordered the nature preserve. The closer you get, the slower we go, Ross muttered, tapping the brake a few times. They were approaching the Laurelton town limits where a park of double wides called Country Court housed folks that Skye referred to as the working poor. Across the road, the Pentecostal church sign proclaimed, this is God's country in red pulsing light. Ross swerved when a ball of mud and gravel skittered across the windshield and Skye cried out. He hit the brakes and glanced in the rearview mirror just in time to see a shadowy figure in a red hoodie run towards the woods. Cecil's tires squealed and he veered into the ditch just behind them. He threw open his door and gave chase with Ross and Skye trailing him. The grass was wet and the turf was uneven, peppered with groundhog holes eager to wrench knees right out of their sockets. He could hear Ross's footfall squelching and sucking in the mud several yards back. Cecil glanced behind him, saw Skye on his heels, and stumbled. Clearing a fence, the kid melted into the woods. Cecil was bent over, hands on his knees, breathing heavily when Ross caught up to them. You okay? Ross asked. That little son of a bitch sure can run, Cecil said. You get a look at him? I did, Skye said. He, Cecil interrupted her. Looks like Lon, looked like Lon Vance's boy or one of them. Brandy's or Marlo's? 
Your guess is as good as mine. Should we call the police? Skye asked. Cecil snickered. They won't come for this kind of thing, honey, Ross said. Skye frowned. Cecil asked Ross how his mo moccasins held up in heavy water, and Ross flipped him off. Skye started to whistle the theme from the good, the bad, and the ugly. Cecil joined her. She stopped. Cecil, Cecil shined a flashlight on the truck. Ditch put a dent in my fender. Should we go talk to him? Ross asked. It's been tried. A little compassion can go a long way, Skye said. So will a little putty and paint, Cecil said. I'm getting on to supper. He got in the truck and started the engine. Ross waved him ahead, then bright beamed him all the way home on Church Road. Son of a bitch. I'm gonna pause there because I wanna leave us some time for questions and um, give everybody a chance to weigh in and ask us things. But thank you so much for listening today. For sure, thank you, Jamie Lynn. <laughs> I, I don't know if you if you were watching the screens, but I was laughing out loud several times there. <laughs> well, thank you. I get too nervous. I can't look. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, I'll give you give us just a few minutes, please. Um, anyone who's here now, go ahead and put some questions in the chat or and we'll we'll share. Um, While people are thinking of questions, I will say this. If you don't yet have Robert's book and Patty's book, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so sorry, I don't have Margaret's, but you should order them. And like the holidays are coming up and like you can give them away and I'll do a shout out for the review, which published the story and you know, great reading. Like you're here because you love reading. So there's some more great stuff to read. Thanks yeah. for posting and, the link, Getty. Yep, I, I just posted the link to the, the Cornerstone book order page. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so, so you're saying we should have like a book bundle from, from our four books here for the holidays? Why not? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> hear that, Ross? <laughs> yeah, content, wink, wink. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good idea. Yeah, I like, I, I'm pretty sure nobody planned this, but I, I like how we, how you all kind of riffed on that theme of the um, kind of truth and fiction that, um, that uh, Patricia started with. So that was, <laughs> that's a nice way to tie it together. Um, did we get, oh, let's see. Oh, uh, okay. Margaret posted, Danielle, thank you for that insight into how much mileage is in the word run. Okay. So that was a, an earlier comment. Uh, where did it go? Run can mean fleeing, hurrying, operating, illness, um, a lot of other things. Yeah. Well, I, I think the, the fact that she saw these things that I never thought of raises an interesting question about, um, well, maybe raises several interesting questions, <laughs> but, but the writer doesn't always have the final answer about what he or she has written, um, and maybe there aren't any final answers, uh, but it's, it's always such a thrill to have someone help you understand everything that's packed into what you wrote, maybe without awareness of everything that was packed into that. Maybe some of the other um, writers here, uh, whether they were on the panel or whether they're in the audience, want to comment on on those kinds of experiences? Yeah, I think it's that's a really interesting question, Margaret. And I think that, um, I don't know about you guys, I, I imagine it happens for you all readers and, and writers, writers and readers both, that when you write something or read something and then you come back to it and look at it a few years later, you're like, oh man. It, there's there's this thing and I didn't even realize that that was a concern that I had somehow or other kind of circled in the story you know even my own stuff when I read it in a few years you know then I, I look back and I think wow I didn't I didn't know I did that or when somebody else reads it like you said and somebody else reads someone else's work and they they recognize something that that we hadn't intentionally put in there um, but yet there it is 
when someone had put the thing about can of worms as a, as a metaphor. And I hadn't really thought, you know, there were worms in the can, but I hadn't really thought of it as a can of worms. And I think that's like a wonderful, um, a wonderful thing to call any bit of writing. You know, it's a can of worms when we start, so. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'll just jump in on this because this, this is a really great, great discussion point about um, we write these stories and we have intentions for ourselves as writers. This is what I want to do. And when I read stories, I find they read me. You know, what, what do I notice in this? And how, why am I responding to these details in here? So there's this relationship we have with the story. And one of my favorite quotes from Raymond Carver is the best stories always answer themselves, <laughs> okay? And I thought about that for a while. What does he possibly mean by that? But it's like, it's like the resonance that, that comes out of a story that we're not aware of in the making of it and uh, in, in, a, in an instantaneous culture, of course, we're not going to see that. It takes time. And, and you, we read a book and years later, we see something different. Well, the book didn't change by a single word. We've been changing and seeing different things. But I, I love that engagement that's a part of the, the writer, reader, reader, writer relationship. Um, and I'm so glad it's there as a reader and a writer. Yeah, for sure. I think I think a lot of writers find that, and there's been some echoes in the uh, in the chat too of that. Um, yeah, so there's kind of <laughs> almost a separate conversation going on, which is great. Um, but uh, I, I'll, I'll I'll take this opportunity to mention. Um, I see Kim Sor is on on uh, is, has joined us. She's uh, another author who published through Cornerstone um, a couple of years ago, I think. Um, and so anyone. Um, I know all, all our presenters are are elsewhere, right? Oh, sorry, it's the siren test today. If I don't know if you can hear that, um, <laughs> um, but anyone who is in the Stevens Point area, I strongly encourage you to come here to the library this afternoon, and uh, and Kim is going to be presenting um, also today um, in person. So I'll I'll leave it at that. But I <laughs> just wanted to get that in there. I thought the the uh, the focus so that seemed to run through was about place and our relationship with place and it's it's wonderful to be in this panel and and be with other people that are doing the same thing because I when I'm writing it's a solitary experience etc cetera, etc cetera. and so um, how, for the for. for for you others, how, how intentional was it? Was place the start or was it place for you that emerged in the writing? And once you found it pulling and speaking to you, um, how you went with that? Or whether it was just part of the process without it seeming to be in the foreground that comparatively it seems to be. place is essential to one of my mentors used to say out of place comes story so I very often start with place and and in in my work it's really based again on this sort of small town midwest where my grandparents lived where I went to school where I lived for a while as an adult even though I was writing from Chicago it actually helped me to see that other place better you know from some distance instead of with my nose pressed up against it which I think is a little bit what Jamie Lynn was talking about too that sort of outside inside view of the place from where she came. Yeah. Um. I already talked about this in my introduction to my story, but I will add um, one of my, my favorite writers, Louise Erdrich. Um, there's a quote that I keep on my writing wall and I'm looking at it right now and it says, here I am where I ought to be. A writer must have a place where she feels where she feels this, a place to love and be irritated with. <laughs> and I think that, that without that irritation, you know, yeah. all you have is kvetching, right? Sorry, without that irritation, all you have is admiration. And without the love, you know, you've got to have like that mix of tension. And I think that that tension is what informs um, so much of my writing about being in a place where I feel um, an increasing amount 
of ambivalence and increasingly like an outsider. So I have actually felt um, that shifting over time. And I think as a writer, it's important to be very attuned to how you feel about what is home? You know, where do I want to live? You know, is the the big question. And and you're living in that place when you write. So it's um it's a very beautiful kind of like um cycle. Yeah, for sure. I think someone had po had posted in the chat um in Margaret's poem about place about you know where do you want to live and and then somebody said i want to live there so that was <laughs> that was kind of another echo there it was quoting margaret margaret i want to give credit where credit is due <laughs> oh sure sure yeah yeah awesome. Any other questions? We are past 11 o'clock. So, <laughs> I mean, not that that really, mat I mean, really matters. Um, we're having a great conversation, but um, I'm going to, I'm going to run through a little bit more of uh, the official stuff here. Um, I'm going to post um, our link to the survey and I would love it if all of the participants could, um, oh, sorry, send that to everyone. If all of the, if everyone could click on that link and fill out the survey. Um, and that would be really helpful. Let me check my notes, I mentioned that. Um, yep, we got the cornerstone link in there. So, yeah. Um, I just, yeah, I, I want to just <laughs> officially thank everybody, um, all four of you, for being here. It's been a real pleasure. And I think it was, um, yeah, it worked really well to get to get all four of you here and, and kind of meet each other, even though you're all over the country. That's great. Uh, yeah, um, okay. I'm not seeing any more any more questions in the chat, but um, yeah, um, thank you. Um, a couple more pr positive comments in the in the chat. Uh, thank yous and <laughs> everything. So. Um, yeah, thank you all very much for, for being here and um, hope you all have a great rest of your day.